I want to welcome everyone to part two of the three-part series on American Job Center, or AJC, Certification, and Section 188, A Window of Opportunity to Impact Equal Opportunity Policy and Practice for People with Disabilities. I love to say that. There is a lot packed in that uh, title. As I mentioned in the opening for part one, which took place last month, the creation of this series is a collaborative effort and a labor of love between two national technical assistance centers, LEAD and DEI, who you will learn a little bit more about in a minute. Today, in addition to my colleagues, you're going to be hearing from three states that have been an integral part of this collaborative effort. I'm Laura Glenick, and I serve as the project manager for the DEI Technical Assistance Team, which is a collaboration between National Disability Institute and its for-profit arm, NDI Consulting. And I'm going to be serving as your facilitator for today's presentation. So before we begin, I want to go over some logistics regarding the webinar platform. The audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. You can control the audio broadcast via the audio broadcast panel, and you can see an example of what it looks like on the screen. If you accidentally close the panel, you can reopen by going to the Communicate menu located on the top menu bar and choosing Join Audio Broadcast. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or you prefer to listen by phone, you may dial the phone numbers listed here. And they include one Four five four. I'm sorry. One four one five six five five zero zero one, or the toll free number one eight five five seven four nine four seven five zero. You will be prompted to enter a meeting code, which is six six zero three seven one two nine four. And you do not need to enter an attendee ID. You can just press the pound button. Real-time captioning is being provided. The captions can be found in the media viewer panel, which appears in the lower right corner of the web platform. If you want to make the media viewer panel larger, you can minimize other panels above it, which include the chat, the Q&A and or the participant box. We definitely want to hear from you. Your questions and comments about the subject matter and the great examples that you're gonna learn about today. So throughout today's webinar, please use the chat or the Q&A box found on the right-hand side of the screen to send your questions to the host and presenters. And we will direct the questions accordingly during the Q&A portion at the end of today's webinar. And if you are joining using audio only and you're not logged into the webinar, you may ask questions and submit, questions and submit comments to my colleague, Aramide. Her email address is aawosika at ndi-inc.org. Um, just so that you know, this webinar is being recorded and the webinar archive, along with supporting materials, will be placed on the LEAD Center website. If you experience any te technical difficulties during today's webinar, please use the chat box to send a message to the host, again, my colleague, Rama Day, or you may also email her, and I'll provide her email address again, A-A-W-O-S-I-K-A at N-D-I hyphen I-N-C dot org. Uh, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce our two guest presenters uh, and the technical assistance centers that they represent. 
You all know that they both bring background and expertise from the local, state, and national levels of the workforce. Janie Robinson, representing the LEAD Center, provides technical assistance to the National Workforce System on the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, uh, also known as WIOA. Uh, it's equal opportunity and non-discrimination provisions as part of the LEAD Center. She served as a technical assistance team uh, at National Disability Institute under multiple disability employment initiatives for the U.S. Department of Labor. Prior to this, Jamie was a disability navigator under the Disability Program Navigator Initiative in Massachusetts One Stop Career Centers. As well, she is a certified business uh, benefits specialist for an independent living center. As a member of the deaf uh, community, Janie is fluent in American Sign Language and leads efforts to expand communication access nationwide. So let's learn a little bit more about the LEAD Center. The National Center on Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities, known as the LEAD Center, is a collaborative of disability, workforce, and economic empowerment organizations led by the National Disability Institute with funding from the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. The mission of the LEAD Center is to advance sustainable individual and systems level change that results in improved, competitive, integrated employment and economic self-sufficiency outcomes for individuals across the spectrum of disability. Our second presenter, Brian Ingram, represents the Disability Employment Initiative, or DEI. For the past eight years, Brian has been part of the DEI technical assistance team contracted by U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration to provide information, training, and technical assistance to the Disability Employment Initiative. Prior to this, he served as both a disability navigator and as a state lead in Oregon under the Disability Program Navigator Initiative. Brian has extensive experience working with Title I providers at the state, local, and center levels, focusing on access for job seekers with disabilities. So let's learn a little bit more about the DEI. The goal of the Disability Employment Initiative is to expand the capacity of American job centers to improve education, training, and employment outcomes of individuals with disabilities through a career pathways focus in support of WIOA. DEI is administered by the U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration and jointly funded with the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Uh, throughout the presentation, Jamie and Vine will be introducing you to their partners um, from the state level. So uh, before I turn the presentation over to Jamie, I want to take this opportunity to invite Chris Button, Supervisor, Workforce and Policy with the U.S. Department of Labor, Office of Disability Employment Policy, to provide a welcome. So Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Laura. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you so much. I want to just, on behalf of um, the Department of Labor to, and, and ODEP, to welcome everyone to today's webinar, and a special welcome to Jamie and Brian and Laura and our, our lead colleagues, and especially to the state leaders who are going to be presenting today. I'm really excited to hear about how um, they have been working to advance equal opportunity and make sure that the system is really able to provide meaningful, effective opportunity to youth and adults with disabilities. It's really actually a really exciting time, we believe, uh, for, for transformation in the public workforce system, um, especially because the WIOA increased the language that was included specifying that people with disabilities are really important customers 
of the system. And so Section 188 and the equal opportunity provisions really become more important than ever. ODIP has been working collaboratively with ETA, with the Civil Rights Center, and of course with our league colleagues to update the Section 188 Disability Reference Guide. Hopefully everyone on the, the call today um, are aware of the guide and know of the multitude of examples that it includes that American Job Centers can consider implementing in their own AJCs, and also that state leaders can promote its use in a variety of ways. So we're really excited to hear today about what our state leaders have been doing. And without further ado, Laura, I'm gonna turn it back over to you because I'm really anxious to hear today's topic. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Chris. And with that, everybody, um, we're going to get the presentation started. And Jamie, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Laura and Chris, as well as the ODEP team, ETA, also the Civil Rights Center for all your support, all your guidance, especially with this, um, this series. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this next hour and a half. You know, today's webinar is very unique because not only will you hear three different state perspectives and experiences around Section 188 and the AJC certification, but you will hear from many different roles and vantage points from the field within each state. So you will hear from a state workforce development board representative, a policy analyst, a Title I administrator, an equal opportunity officer, leadership from vocational rehabilitation and also for workforce development and a project lead with the Disability Employment Initiative. Um, so before we begin, I want to just give you some context of how did LEAD and DEI kind of get to this point here today um, with uh, this webinar series? What have we learned from so many of you in the field at the state and local levels? And, you know, why is this discussion um, being brought to the forefront today. Um, well, both LEAD and DEI have been engaged in WIOA implementation from policy to practice. And as part of LEAD, I had the opportunity to work with state equal opportunity officers from all across the country and very closely um, with several here today from Missouri and Virginia. And this work has led to experiencing kind of firsthand you know, the impact of partnerships in implementing Section 188 as a framework to equal opportunity and accessibility in the workforce system and as part of the AJC certification process. And, you know, these are partnerships between equal opportunity and vocational rehabilitation, between diverse cross-partner systems, between WIOA policy administrators and program implementers, and they are in collaboration with DEI and other uh, disability employment initiatives in developing promising practices. And I do kind of want to turn to uh, Brian, my colleague here, to share a little bit about how DEI um, kind of collided with this work um, uh, as well uh, with LEAD around Section 188. Brian? Oh, very much, Jamie, and Brian here. And uh, I'd like to thank all of the sponsors that Jamie thanked, although I'm not going to go through them all again. Um, we're, we're grateful for this opportunity. And as to your question is how I ran into this, well, um, in my job as a disability uh, employment initiative TA liaison, I'm working closely with states as well and have been the whole time LIOA has been implemented, passed and implemented. And indeed, I started running into a lot of the same issues and topics and talking to the same people that Jamie was talking to out in the field and finding out a lot of the same issues that she identified. Um, it all came to a head, though, when I was very flattered to be invited to a meeting in Virginia. Uh, it, was their, it was their access team, state-level meeting, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and I was really flattered and excited to go to the meeting. And when I called in and showed up, who should I hear was a founding member of the group, but my colleague, Jay. <laughs> so this got us thinking. Um, and that's kind of how this training came to be. We, we saw a lot of things in common in the work that we were doing, a lot of themes, 
around this topic. And so we thought it might be great to bring some providers from out in the field together and have them present to you some of the things that they were discovering and thinking about and implementing. That's what I got, Jamie. Okay, great, Brian, thank you. And so what we've learned in these experiences with all of these partnerships is that Section 188 and the AJC certification together offer this incredibly powerful window of opportunity to really closely evaluate accessibility, especially programmatic accessibility, to survey and kind of better understand the awareness around these regulations and practices. It's a chance to educate the system around effective strategies. And it's really that window to kind of open up pathways to employment for people with disabilities. And so we know that all core partners now share some aspects of AJC service delivery. And that means having a level of awareness of 188 across those core partners. We know that 188, which is aligned with the Americans with Disability Act, provides the foundation to AJC certification. We know that equal opportunity officers are charged with implementing 188 compliance and that vocational rehabilitation is that system's subject matter expert in disability and accessibility. We also know that AJCs and partners are in need of resources and strategies to implement both. Um, so I actually regularly hear from workforce boards, one-stop operators, equal opportunity officers, VR, everybody that we're going to be talking to today about action. How can we move from policy into action and operationalize those policies on the ground? And so that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, before we do, um, I do want to touch on this reflection that we actually ended with on our part one of our webinar. Um, and we left off with this slide, um, but if you are seeing this for the first time, perhaps you can kind of think about these questions today um, as you hear why they have become so pertinent and are so important for the three states participating today. And who is uh, leading your state's AJC certification? process. Is it one entity or many? Are the core partners, all the core partners involved? Is your equal opportunity officer and vocational rehabilitation involved in that process? If so, how are they involved? What's their role? Are state and local cross systems with a variety of disability and community partners involved in the process? Um, if they are, how? What are their roles? And has your state surveyed a diversity of management and AJCs, staff, customers with and without disabilities, partners on 188 and accessibility to get to know the, the experiences across um, all of those different people. Has your state provided training on 188? And who will monitor your state's continuous improvement plans and provide technical assistance on compliance issues? And with that, I'm happy to officially kick off part two of our webinar, which is state workforce systems that are making equal opportunity a priority, Virginia, California, and Missouri. Welcome. <laughs> um, and here are our objectives uh, for today's webinar. We want to uh, learn about effective strategies that can be replicated in other regions to ensure equal opportunity compliance and expand accessibility to individuals with disabilities. And that includes leveraging expertise from diverse workforce and disability partners uh, to influence and impact policy and procedures that can increase accessibility. It's initiating statewide training efforts around Section 188, especially um, with an emphasis on programmatic access. Increasing funding to support an effective state EO program. We'll hear more about that. Leveraging promising practices from a disability employment initiative or other initiatives that you may have in your state that really aim to uh, improve outcomes for individuals with disabilities. And employing AJC certification processes that motivate American job centers to more strategically really look closely at accessibility and develop continuous improvement plans that demonstrate progress. So with that, Brian, uh, I am going to turn it over to you to introduce our Virginia team. 
Thank you very much. Um, today we have three speakers from Virginia. They're going to talk to you about uh, their progress and their efforts around Section 188 implementation and how they brought partners together uh, kind of through a state level effort to make this happen. And I, I think this is very important. We have three speakers today, and the first one is Aida Pacheco, who is a Special Projects Coordinator for the Virginia Community Colleges System Workforce Development Services Division. She manages various initiatives that focus on underserved and underrepresented populations, uh, such as they're serving in their DEI Round A. Hello, Aida, are you there? Hello, Brian, yes. Welcome. It's really Thank great you. to talk to you. And I think uh, I, I have some questions for you that I think are going to really help to uh, illuminate what went on out there in Virginia that we're so excited about. So I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Are you ready for some questions? Go for it. Okay, Aida. Why don't you start us off by providing some background information on Virginia's workforce system and infrastructure for our listeners so they kind of understand, you know, the scene. Sure, Brian, and, and thank you for inviting us. As you can see from the slide, if you can show the slide on the chart, um, the governor is the chief officer for our workforce system, and he set the tone by pledging to fight for an economy that works for everyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they live. Then our General Assembly last year elevated workforce development by creating a new cabinet level position that is filled by the chief workforce advisor to coordinate an array of about 24 state programs to prepare, prepare Virginians with the skills required by employers for new technical fields, as well as more traditional jobs the state currently isn't keeping pace to fill with qualified workers. Our Board of Workforce Development, as you can see here, works closely with the governor and his chief advisor to provide strategic leadership and policy direction to the 15 designated local workforce development areas. Now, we elected to submit a combined plan that included the input of state entities beyond the WIOA title programs, such as our Human Service Agency. Currently, Virginia has 20 comprehensive centers and over 40 affiliates. In addition to that, many of our local workforce development areas establish over 70 share or career access network sites, which are faith-based community organizations that help with outreach. That's great. Uh, that, that's a wonderful description, Aida. Thank you. Um, can I ask you another question? Yes. Go for it again, okay. Brian. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. You sound very ready. So what is Virginia's general approach to accessibility? How, how do you look at it at the state level? Virginia's approach to accessibility, we believe, is inclusive and collaborative, incorporating universal design into both our planning and one-stop certification processes. There are two main principles that guide our work. One, access to centers is everyone's responsibility. And two, access to the centers is for everyone. We adopted this approach building on our existing infrastructure and strengthening our partnerships. We also took the lessons learned from previous efforts, such as the Disability Program Navigator Initiative, which set the scene for the future in current DEI, to design a process that would both expand access and increase outcomes for all of our customers. Now, gosh, I am sure the other state panelists here can relate when I say that even under the most optimal conditions, Collaboration across partner systems can be difficult to achieve. For Virginia, it is even more challenging to sustain efforts as the only state with a one-term governor. However, our longstanding collaborative with workforce partners and the leadership at both the state and the local level, especially from our Title IV administrator, which, by the way, is our state's vocational rehabilitation agency, kept Virginia focused pretty much on the bigger picture, which is building access for everyone is very intrinsic to the delivery of great customer service. So the commitment and persistence of this leadership carried over this focus to the next administration. Wow, that, that's impressive. And, you know, that leads nicely into another question, Aida. Mm -hmm. So given Virginia's inclusive and collaborative approach to accessibility, how have you guys implemented Section 188 and conducted your AJC certification? And was this the same approach that you took in previous years? It's kind of a two-parter. Yeah, that's, that's a good question and a loaded one, Brian. Um, but we believe, and I, I strongly believe, that one of the best decisions our store, 
State Board made was in 2006 when VR and other workforce partners were invited to serve on our one-stop committee. VR's voice on this committee influenced the revision of the one-stop policy adopted by the board in 2010, stipulating that a workforce center had to be determined accessible according to the ADA accessibility standards before it could be charted as a comprehensive one-stop. Now, what is different from the previous years is the creation of the Accessibility Task Force in 2016, as recommended in Virginia's We Owe a Combined State Plan section to enhance accessibility of our one-stop system and customer service experience. Also new, Brian, was designating the WIOA Title I Administrator at the Virginia Community College System to assume a lead role in the implementation. So frankly, if, if, if accessibility is truly everyone's responsibility, then the onus shouldn't always fall on our lead VR agency, just like folks at the local level shouldn't automatically refer every individual with a disability who walks through the center's doors to a VR agency. Now, to get sure. us on the same level of understanding, we committed to all receiving training on WIOA from a disability perspective in Section 188, learning key provisions of the law that are different from WIA. We also had the DEI project partners on the ground demonstrating and relaying back to the task force what effective programmatic access looks like, and more importantly, how it can lead to employment outcomes. Believe me. Believe me when I say there were some growing pains when this diverse crew craning traction towards the common ground. But we got there, and it was well worth the consistent efforts and communication. We were able to develop a common understanding needing to move forward with the framework and the development of an action plan. So did I address your question? <laughs> you sure did. I, you are very informed, Aida, and I appreciate it. So we're doing so well. I'm going to ask you another question. How about oh, this one? Mm -hmm. Were any other partnerships beneficial to improving accessibility in policy or practice for you guys? Did, did you take oh. advantage of any other relationships? Oh, yes, we did. Um, the task force is composed of staff um, from 14 workforce partners, including representation from our local workforce development areas. This is the first time that such a diverse representation of state agencies was convened to focus on accessibility that included Departments for the Blind and Vision Impaired, Deaf and Hard of Hearing, and the Centers for Independent Living. It was also the first time our EEO officers were um, for WIO with Title I and Title III were invited to the table at this level of deliberations. Another key player invited to the table was the Executive Director to our State uh, Board of Workforce Development, and who at our first meeting delivered remarks on the Board's vision and expectations. This set the framework for the task force. We all know the importance of establishing a shared vision and mission, but for Virginia, what was unique or different was the development of a shared vision and mission focused solely on accessibility with input from our workforce partners. We committed right. to work together as a team to focus on and take action around the following four priority areas. One, universal access for all workforce system facilities. Two, policies and procedures. Three, training for all workforce partners in communication and outreach. And, um, that, well, that was the last one, I'm sorry. Uh, training for work for partners, and four, I know, I kind of ran through there, and four, communication outreach. Each partner then volunteered to lead one or two priority areas, and my STEAM colleagues uh, later will provide a few examples of the strategies implemented. Well, Aida, this has been fascinating, and I don't want to cut you off, but we do have two more folks from uh, Virginia, I think, who have, have some comments they want to make. So are there any final comments that you'd like to share from your perspective uh, from Virginia that uh, other states might be able to take away? Gosh, I, I, only to emphasize that this is truly an ongoing process for all of us to ensure that access is everyone's responsibility while leveraging expertise from VR and other disability agencies has, has been essential in our state, Virginia will continue to build an in existing infrastructure to encourage shared ownership among all partners, fostering systems integrations through cross-agency collaboration at all levels, and design access to services from a customer perspective. As Laura stated in her introduction, um, this is a shared labor of love, Brian. I, I can see that, and it's amazing the participation level you've got. So yeah, thank we're you, very Aida. Proud of that. Yeah, I'm very proud I, of it. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, and I'd like to thank introduce you. the audience. You're very welcome. I'd like to introduce to the audience Constance Green. 
Now, Constance is the WIOA Adult and Dislocated Worker Program State Coordinator under the Title I Administrator. She's also responsible for coordinating WIOA adult and dislocated worker programs, including the development and implementation of policy, provision of technical assistance to local workforce development areas, and a bunch of other <laughs> partners and leadership for this AJC certification process. So we're very lucky and very happy to have you on board here, Constance. Thank How are you. you? I'm great, thanks. Okay, well, I think you know the you know the routine. I've got some questions for you. Are you ready okay. to answer? Okay. Sure. Here's the first one. What was your experience as part of the task force from a policy perspective? Had you been a part of a cross agency collaboration before? It's a two parter. Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, I was invited to participate by our Title One team lead, and it was a great experience. Still is. Uh, it was a first for me to engage in a multi-agency team focused specifically on accessibility issues, and my leadership felt that it would be very useful. Fortunately, they were correct. So tell me, why was it important for you to be a part of this task force, Constance? Well, it was important to be a part of the task force for several reasons. First of all, to represent Title I from the policy and programs perspective. Second, to understand accessibility issues at a deeper level as they relate to Title I activities. And finally, to make the connection between the task force and the one-stop certification process. Mm -hmm. While I had a basic understanding beforehand about physical accessibility issues, I worked for our former lieutenant governor and he has a disability. Uh, this opportunity of being in the task force allowed me to really expand that knowledge and it helped me to lead a really a more comprehensive and effective one-stop certification process. Well, can you, can you share with us what was beneficial to having a policy perspective at the table, just in terms of impacting and improving accessibility? Sure. It helped me to raise awareness at my own agency, and it allowed me access to the subject matter experts that Aida was mentioning, the folks with the actual operational experience. That was pretty helpful when crafting our statewide policy and the supporting guidance documents. Um, as some of you may know, as a policy person, I live in a land of laws and regulations. So my cohorts on the task force provided a practical application perspective that helped me to digest, correctly interpret, and then apply the large volume of information on accessibility that comes in under WIOA. And it helped me develop an understanding of the issues at the granular level that impacted my policy writing. So that's pretty interesting. Could you give us an example of that? Sure. So as you know, accessibility is a mandatory component of the one-stop center certification process. Uh, without the relationships developed on the task force, I would have been faced with developing the accessibility piece of the certification tool in a complete vacuum. <laughs> Additionally, parts of the tool actually reference assistive technology, and through the task force, I had VR representatives to provide feedback and help me to address the specific assistive technology questions from the local level. Um, I definitely now have an appreciation for the value of pocket talkers and video relay interpreting for our one-stop customers. So in policy writing, it really does help to have clear definitions and an understanding of the real impact on the people who are implementing your policies. So another thing is that participation in the group allowed me to network with the partner agencies that I didn't normally work with. Um, Aida mentioned we had quite a few agencies on this task force. This opened doors allowing for insights and new inputs, and the variety of perspectives and experience helped me to connect the dots to inform policy to practice. Um, we, I was able to draw on the experts to supplement my admittedly limited knowledge, and frankly, the one-stop certification policy process would have been suffering if I didn't have their help. <laughs> so now we're working together to craft better policy and framing policy discussions with an eye towards practical application in a way that enhances accessibility in Virginia rather than just enforcing it. Wow. So could you please share some actions that were taken as a result of your participation in the task force? How'd that, how'd that work into actions, Constance? Sure. I can give you three examples that were, uh, we, we had happen. First of all, we developed in the State Workforce Board passed a Services to Individuals with Disabilities Policy. That's a state-level policy that laid the groundwork for a consistent approach to Section 188 ADA compliance across all the WIOA programs not just Title I. Um, previously, our accessibility at the one stops had centered primarily on the physical access, you know, the good old tape measure thing. 
uh, without addressing programmatic accessibility. So the actions we took under WIA just aren't sufficient anymore, and this task force is allowing us to address the changes that WIOA brought and to make them relevant to the AJCs and to our state-level partners. So that's one. Secondly, and this is the part I'm excited about, in particular, the task force members became an official part of the AJC certification process. I enlisted them. The members assisted with developing and vetting the criteria for the program and programmatic accessibility portion of the certification tool itself. There were 23 questions surrounding accessibility. That were, they're very specific and we went back and forth. With, I was excited about that. That was great, great input from their part. They also participated in the review of the submitted certification documentation from the local level and many of the members actually participated with me in the on-site certification validation visits to the one stops throughout the entire state. So that's, that was a big one. And finally, um, and this one's pretty neat too, is our Title I Administrator and our VR Assistant Director, as a result of this task force, jointly developed a letter of agreement with the Virginia Association for Centers for Independent Living to both finance and conduct accessibility surveys for our AJCs as part of the one-stop certification process. This has not only provided a statewide level of standardization on the assessment, but it's also relieved a fiscal and procurement burden on our local workforce development areas who are very happy to have that. Well, my goodness, that's a lot of stuff. That's, <laughs> it's very impressive. Uh, Constance, I know that we could talk to you all afternoon and it would be fascinating, but I know Sinclair's waiting in the wings. So I'm going to ask you if you have any last words you want to add before we give Sinclair the opportunity to comment. Sure. Um, I can safely say that in, in Virginia, Section 188 and ADA compliance is improving. Um, but beyond that, we're increasing awareness and understanding of accessibility at the state and the local level. And the technical assistance connections that have occurred between the task force members, the local workforce boards, and the local one-stop staff are really paving the way for positive change. Where these relationships that we're building are going to outlive us as individuals in these positions is our goal. Uh, and finally, in Virginia, we really believe that WIOA does represent an, or present to us an opportunity for our separate title agencies to leverage by leaning forward together on accessibility issues. The value added of engagement is paying off because we're having other partners join the accessibility discussions beyond the mandatory title partners. And we really started a significant conversation here that sets the stage for a much deeper dive than just completing the generic mandatory checklist for compliance purposes. So with that, I'll turn sure. it over to you to talk to Sinclair. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Constance. You certainly did. I, I, it's wonderful to hear. Um, and now we'd like to move on to our final presenter from Virginia, Sinclair Hubbard. Sinclair is with the VR's Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services, and she's worked on many of VR's previous DOL Disability Employment Grants. Currently, she's the DOL Disability Employment Initiative's Project Lead, well, Lead Disability Resource Coordinator. Uh, VR is a very strategic partner with Title I in implementing the DEI Round 8. Um, and I have had the pleasure of working directly with Sinclair for many years. And so it is my pleasure to say hello, Sinclair. Are you there? Hello, Brian. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. It's nice to speak with you today. And uh -huh. I think you must know how this is going by now. I've got some questions. I think questions. I get it. Uh-huh. Yep. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to start asking you these questions, and you can give us the answers. So the first one is, can you share how VR and DEI took a leadership role on the task force and how this impacts the WIOA and the VR systems in a larger sense. Sure, I can, Brian. One thing I think from a historical perspective that people need to understand for, it's been well over 15 years, that VR took a leadership role in Virginia to build relationships and cross-agency partnerships at the state and local levels. And our VR Assistant Commissioner has been a strategic partner leading all of the DOL Disability Employment Initiative grants. This leadership role has kept accessibility and employment for job seekers with disabilities basically on everyone's radar screens. He doesn't let them off on this, this concept <laughs> at all. That is true. Um, yeah. Yes. And additionally, he's also on the state-level WIOA implementation team. He chairs the state-level Career Pathways Workgroup 
and oversees the workforce MOUs and cost allocation plans that we all love um, associated for VR participation at the AJCs. So his participation really has helped ensure disability is integrated across all priority areas in the state. And I think a, an important um, strategy that was implemented way back in the beginning of the DOL Disability Employment Initiative Grant, um, we established an executive management committee at the state level so that that group could provide guidance and oversight for project implementation. Well, we put together, a, a, or the VR commissioner put together a very di diverse group of representatives for this committee, and this committee then garnered cross-agency buy-in to provide key recommendations for state policy development, leadership direction, and project implementation, as well as the endorsement for us to um, apply for the Disability Program Navigator and also the Disability Employment Initiative Grant. So the efforts of this committee focused on improving accessibility for the one-stop system and for services for job seekers with disabilities. Then through VR, <laughs> um, Disability Employment Initiative, Title I, and other key state partnerships, we were able to leverage our existing resources and tap into other people with the operational experience to build and establish the diverse cross-agency rep representation that has been discussed here on, for our accessibility task force. And that group is driving the development of state-level policies today. Currently, this task force, composed of all the many members of that executive management committee, um, was further enhanced, as we've already heard, by adding our EEO officers to mm -hmm. that group. And, and heretofore, that had not happened. Um, and so this level of cross-title and core partners and the varied roles represented from state to local level has really moved collaboration into action. So, Brian, I think it's important for folks to know that in 2016, VR and DEI management collaborated with the Title I staff, and we helped develop the accessibility section of the combined state plan. In that plan, the seed was planted to establish the accessibility task force, and many of the themes we have discussed here today were included in that plan as guidelines for the task force moving forward. So Sinclair, it sounds like full access was modeled from the VR-led disability employment grants, and some of those strategies were used as a springboard to help Virginia to move forward. That's, I mean, is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. And okay, so then what, Ryan, what? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, so what DEI project activities were seen as valuable by the state uh, and the workforce plan, folks? Well, VR and DEI being involved at the state and local levels has really promoted working relationships that have been instrumental in developing the resources and service collaboration among multiple uh, agency workforce partners. We supported significant re resource mapping statewide, the who does what and how kind of thing, and right. we became the disability resource that's known for promoting access for all job seekers and for systems alignment. So we're essentially the go-to technical assistance on the ground around disability and accessibility, especially for programmatic access. For example, included in our state plan, we um, use the integrated resource team strategy to provide wraparound services to address job seekers with multiple barriers, including those with disabilities. We also promoted relevant state and local trainings, disability trainings, and under DEI-8, Excuse me. We um, sure. sorry, allergies. Take your time. Sorry, it's a bad day for allergies in Virginia, especially where <laughs> I am. How well, I can have. Um, but we also then continued under DEI eight the implementation of the DOL endorsed customer center design team process to improve our services from the customer's perspective. And that's basically um, about people with and without disabilities. So Brian, oh. as a result of the practices from previous disability initiative grants, we have recommended the following to be included in our WIOA Title I reporting system to track joint program planning services, which are IRTs, co-enrollments with all four WIOA titles, and identification of people with disabilities who self-disclose after registration or enrollment. Oh, my goodness. That, that was a lot. Uh, 
So I just have one more question for you, Sinclair, um, and it's in, in the form of a wrap-up. And what I, what I would like to ask you, what's the most important thing you've learned by going through this process? You well, need to take a second to drink water. That's all right. <laughs> I did. I did. Thank you. No, I'm glad you asked me that because through the collaborative cross-agency partnerships, we establish multiple state, regional, and local level working relationships. It's kind of like what they say about buying real estate, location, location, mm -hmm. location. Well, in our <laughs> workforce system, <laughs> it's about building relationships, relationships, relationships. So our relationships from the top down and bottom up from the state, regional, and local levels can make a difference. I hope we in Virginia have shared with you all today how our efforts have shaped us moving forward to enhance access for all job seekers. Thanks, Brian, for this opportunity to share with others. Well, thank you for sharing with us, Sinclair. And I'd like to say, Jamie, that wraps up our Virginia section. And I believe we're going to move next to Missouri. Is that right? Hi, Brian. Um, yes. Everyone can kind of take a, a quick look here at some of oh, the major points that, sure, major points that that were brought up. Um, you will be able to have access to this uh, PowerPoint after, so you can take another look. Um, actually, Brian, next up is California. Ah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, yeah, we're very excited to have California on deck right now. Um, and they've been doing some amazing work at the state level around certification that we wanted to share with you. Uh, we have two folks from California who are ready to speak today, the first of which is Morgan Lardizable. And she's the Associate Governmental Program Analyst uh, with the Employment Development Department, or EDD. Morgan, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm very good. I'm guessing you know the routine. I think I got down. I've, I've cleverly crafted some questions for you, and I'd like for you to answer. Um, so this is the first one. Can you describe California's workforce development infrastructure and approach to the state's AJC certification policy? And if you could, could you describe both levels, both the baseline and the hallmarks of excellence? And then finally, this is our only three-parter, I think. Why don't you go with two levels? All right. <laughs> Uh, so first off, California's workforce infrastructure includes my department's EDD, Employment Development Department, and our state board, or the California Workforce Development Board, which our second speaker, Carlos, is from. Uh, we work in partnership to deliver and monitor all of our workforce policy from the state level. And currently, we have 45 local areas throughout our state, and each one, of course, has at least one comprehensive center. and at I think pretty much everyone has at least one affiliate right now, probably more than that, um, or even specialized centers. So that's kind of a quick overview of our whole infrastructure system. Okay. And then... That's... Go ahead. Uh, are you ready to move on to our next part of that question? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so our certification process was developed into two different levels to really try and combat the different components within the certification as it was laid out in uh, WIOA. So our baseline certification was developed to ensure that all of our comprehensive AJCs are in compliance with all the statutory regulatory requirements of WIOA relating to the memorandums of understanding, our one-stop operators, our career service providers, and meeting all of those EEO standards. Um, as a basis for creating continuous improvement, as is mandated, we created the hallmarks of excellence. So those hallmarks identify areas where comprehensives are performing well, where they're exceeding expectations, and where they might need some improvement. And the hallmarks themselves came from all of our vision documents, which are really our state plan, other state policies we have, and really that overall vision that WIOA has for the seamless delivery system. So all those vision documents are really, it's the law itself, uh, DOL, TEGLs, and all of our own state sure. policy. Um, so like I said, we decided to split it up into two levels as the baseline criteria are not subjective items. They're all fairly matter of fact when it comes to compliance. Um, so it's pretty much an easy kind of checklist. Are we doing these things? If we're not doing these things, why? those kind of issues. Um, it's also most important that the comprehensive one-stops 
be meeting all of those points. If they're not meeting the compliance components, then we kind of don't care about the hallmarks at this point because we need to first tackle those bigger issues. Okay. Um, so then after we have all of that done, uh, the hallmarks of excellence come into play and we build on um, all of that to make sure we have continuous improvement going, make sure we're meeting all of those kind of vision areas, identifying where people are doing things perfectly, when maybe just, again, where they need that improvement. And so, it will work. Yeah. So um, we currently have our comprehensive plan out in, in place, and we're building up our affiliate process, which is essentially mirroring the same process. It's just going to be where those compliance issues won't pertain to affiliates, such as being a comprehensive one-stop. We're not going to obviously require our affiliates to meet that one. Um, and some of our hallmarks are also a little bit more specific to comprehensive. So. Okay, so what was the development of the policy a collaborative approach? And uh, what, were, what were the partners at the table in developing that AJCC certification process? You know, like core disability, the ELOs, who was there? Okay, yeah, uh, we convened a work group that comp comprised of a consultant, uh, the EDD, the state board, we had state level partners such as Department of Rehab, Department of Education, and then representatives from a few of our local workforce boards. So with okay. our consultant, we worked to create a starting point and for the work group and mainly determining the one-stop requirements and figuring out a means of continuous improvement, which we then changed into our hallmarks. And we wanted to ensure that the policy included realistic and attainable criteria, so it really helped to have those local level partner meetings. And okay. um, in order to reach that point, we had multiple partner meetings with everyone. They were pretty much all day long fun meetings, <laughs> um, some over the phone, a couple in person, and we would really discuss pros and cons of various methods until we reached a policy that was ultimately disseminated. So, for example, while creating the policy, we had a fairly robust discussion around the role a local board can play if they are their own operator versus only being their own career services provider. That one was kind of like a whole half-day meeting just within itself. I bet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. So can you describe the benefits of shared certification procedures uh, to the other partner programs that are participating? What's in it for them? And yeah, we have all those kind of partner benefits and essentially requirements built straight into our policy. So yeah. our current policy focuses on the comprehensive and what they're already required to be, and they're already required to be working with all of our partners. And um, so that part was fairly easy to incorporate in. Um, we even have a hallmark titled, the AJC actively supports the one-stop system through effective partnerships. And we've really opened that up to being outside of just our core partners. We really try to include all of those required and local level partners. Um, for example, when conducting customer surveys, they shouldn't only be talking to our Title I participants. They should be talking to the center participants, right? So anyone who comes in for any of those other services. So it helps bring more focus onto how our partners are working cohesively within our AJCs to provide that seamless delivery to all participants. And we really tried to keep the language more open throughout the policy by using terms such as all AJCC staff, not saying appropriate or partner programmer staff or anything like that. Okay, so how did the, how did the continuous improvement policy guidelines fit into your state's overall WIOA implementation? We created uh, what we called quality indicators for each hallmark. So we had eight hallmarks, and then within each one of those was a number of these quality indicators, and those really helped us to quantify and address the continuous improvement. And um, they're more direct items the evaluator can look for when addressing each hallmark individually, as some are more compliance-based and others are more vision or ideal-based. Um, for example, our third hallmark focuses around effective partnerships. A couple of those quality indicators are that the required partners are meeting on a regular basis, that the AJCCs are actively reaching out to those non-co-located partners to make sure everyone is still benefiting from things like workshops and really interacting with the AJC. Um, by using these indicators, the evaluator and the partners can see where their meeting or not meeting concepts and ideals developed by the state and in our vision for implementing WIOA 
Um, we have received positive feedback from our local areas regarding the process, and I'm being required to actually spend the time to evaluate how they're doing on these various points, especially with some of those EEO policies. It's really making them take the time to sit down and do it and devote resources to something that everyone kind of wants to be doing, but not necessarily everyone will make themselves do. Okay. So it really seems as though our locals have wanted a reason to go out and do this. So it's been overall fairly positive. That's great, and that leads us perfectly into this wrap-up question. Just like anybody else, I'd, I'd like to ask you, Morgan, what lessons were learned by going through this process? You know, what would you change? What would you keep? And what would you enhance? At this point, it's a little hard to say. We're still within the process a bit, so it's, we're right in the middle of our initial round of it, and we've only really completed that baseline level. So happily, all 45 of our local areas completed our baseline, which means we're at least doing our compliance issues. Um, and we're currently drafting that affiliate and specialized version of the certification process and just trying to really keep that consistent with our comprehensive process. So we're taking that opportunity to kind of look back at our comprehensive process that's out there right now. But really, until we kind of get to the end of it, we don't have a whole lot of robust feedback on maybe what we would change and what we want to keep. Sure. Um, but as we've said, pretty much everything's been fairly positive from what we've heard so far. far. And there are pieces of both baseline and hallmarks that aren't going to work, as I said before, in our affiliate center policy in comparison to the scope of the comprehensive ones. So our goal is to really balance creating a robust process that helps our one-stops and partners without placing too much of an administrative burden, and we hopefully feel like we've achieved that. So if we could, we'd like to make the process for halt marks a little less subjective, but we have yet to determine how to do that without getting too prescriptive, as we are such a large state and all 45 of our local areas are very diverse. They are. California is a very diverse state. Well, thank you very, very much for uh, coming here today and sharing with us. And yeah, I know you have a colleague in the room with you. Yes, uh, Mr. Carlos Bravo, how are you today, sir? All right, Brian, how are you? Are you holding on? <laughs> I am. I'm holding on for dear life here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carlos, you are the WIOA Directive's local and state board liaison for the California Workforce Development Board. And we're really happy to have you on the line today. And I guess you know how this goes by now. I've got some questions for you. All are right. you ready? Yep, let's do it. Okay, Carlos. How has Section 188 provided the framework for AJCC certification policy and procedures in California? And then there's a little addendum. What role have the state and local equal opportunity officers played in California to align Section 188 and AJC certification policy and procedures? They're related, but slightly different questions. You ready? Right. Yeah. So, sure. First of all, thanks for, you know, Morgan and I, thank you for having us here to talk Absolutely. about what we're doing in California. Um, but, yeah, so in, in California, so I'll start with the second part first. Um, sure. The state equal opportunity officer monitors all 45 local workforce development areas. Uh, we call them local areas for short, uh, uh, for compliance with WIOA Section 188. In October 2017, the State Equal Opportunity Officer, um, the, I'll just start saying EOO, uh, started to conduct some on-site monitoring reviews of all the local areas. Each local area has at least one comprehensive one-stop. So um, some local areas have many comprehensive um, areas uh, or one-stops. Uh, they have some affiliates and uh, specialized one-stops. So for example, one area in particular has like 14 affiliate and specialized uh, agencies. AJCCs. We call them AJCCs here, uh, but AJCs. Um, so we have a very diverse state. Um, there's, you know, the, the economic outlook of these areas, they all look very different. So um, they vary in number of um, comprehensive and affiliate and satellite um, AJCCs. Um, so uh, the state EEO EOO uh, collects the data on the local area's compliance with physical and programmatic accessibility requirements of the WIOA Section 188. For baseline certifications, the local boards um, had to certify that the one-stops um, ensure equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities in accordance with ADA, um, with the ADA, with Section 188, and all other applicable federal and state guidance. 
um, the, legal, the local boards can use the data collected by the state EOO to achieve the, um, the baseline certification. Um, as part of the hallmark of excellence certification process, the, um, the local EOO is asked and required to peri periodically review the one-stops policies, procedures, and facility for accessibility and equal opportunity, and then provide recommendations and staff training where needed. For the most part, the, EO, uh, the EOO and one-stop certification really align very nicely because both aim to ensure that people with disabilities are provided with physical and programmatic accessibilities and um, are not discriminated against in any way. Okay, so along those lines, Carlos, can you provide examples in terms of physical and programmatic accessibility evaluation and improvement in California? Sure. Yeah, so in terms of physical accessibility, local areas must ensure that one stops are ADA compliant, as, a, as we mentioned earlier, by periodically monitoring the one stop facilities. The state EOO will also conduct annual on site reviews of all the local areas for compliance. Since we conduct periodic monitoring, um, ADA compliance is, uh, for the most part, or well, I would say in general, maintained. Um, additionally, what I would say is that um, as part of the hallmarks of excellence, um, we have a lot of uh, um, a lot of the indicators and actual hallmarks that are oriented around um, disability accessibility and um, and things of that nature. Okay, can you can you run through those? Uh, oh, the actual indicators. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a few, um, and so let's see here. Uh, I, I can I can go through some of them real quick. Thank you. Um, so, for example, um, let's see here. Oh, um, you know what, Carlos? I I don't want to put you out. So let me ask you another question. Yeah. Yeah. How, how are local? How are local boards motivated to work with AJCCs to achieve baseline certification? And Good. did local partners such as VR or disability resource coordinators assist in evaluating access with you guys? They have. So um, that's a really good question. So we've had a really, um, uh, we being California, we've really tried to have a very robust and collaborative process with all our partners, not just um, necessarily DOR. So um, we also work uh, very uh, comprehensively with um, the, the local health, um, you know, DHS, um, so our health services, um, you know, DSS, disability services. Um, right. So we have many departments in California that are oriented around um, providing and um, advocating for access to services for participants that have disabilities. And so what we've done, um, you know, EDD and the State Board has really tried to bring them in that process. So, you know, we had them, uh, those agencies be a part of the state plan. Um, we've had them be a part of the um, local and regional planning guidance. Um, and we've also had them be a part of the, um, of the one-stop certification process, as well as the MOUs. So, um, so really, in every step along the way since I'd say 2015, we've been in close contact with these partners, and we, um, you know, we have a series of work groups, and we have all those partners provide input and participate in those work groups. That's great, thank you. So, what are some of the challenges in implementing California certification, in terms of the development of procedures to support that new policy? and in communicating the new policies and procedures to the field? Um, so some of the challenges, um, they include uh, getting the word out to the field, you know, like you were, um, like you, you just mentioned, and I think um, has been touched on a little bit. We're very much in our nascent process of developing these uh, partnerships and collaborations. So, you know, we here at the state, we're still very much like, you know, developing these um, partnerships. We're trying to learn a lot more about these departments and where they can help, where can there be potential for collaboration. And sometimes it's hard to disseminate that down to the local level. So I would say that's a really big challenge. So, you know, um, the, what we've done to address that challenge is really, um, really have a, a very, uh, you know, 
involved conversation and discourse with all these agencies so that if, um, you know, concerns ever arise that we can sort of try to address them immediately. Okay. So, Carlos, finally, what are some next steps for California to continue to expand access and equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities uh, through Section 188 and through AJC certification? So um, we want to continue to make all the partners a part of the certification process. The process would be similar to what we did with the development of the AJCC certification policy. The goal in California is to build and develop partnerships. We are not yet done and we have a long way to go, but the process has begun. Um, with communication of the policy and procedures with the field, we will continue to develop directives and assist partners in developing policy for their respective fields and continue TA from the EDD regional advisors and the state board. Well, thank you. Um, that's a, those were great answers to the questions. Uh, do you have any final comments you'd like to add before we, we move to the next state and thank everybody who's presented from California. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, what we're doing here in California. Again, um, California is a very big state, um, so, you know, we've had, uh, it's been a, a few years in the making to develop these uh, relationships, but we, and we still have a long way to go, but we're, mm -hmm. um, we're very engaged with these partners, and we find this to be um, an invaluable part of the process, and so we're really excited to, um, to really um, have true partnership and really uh, leverage what the WIOA was, you know, the spirit of WIOA, which is, you know, working um, with not just core partners, but all these agencies that exist to provide the most services to the most people possible. Well said. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Okay. I think we're wrapping up here on California. And uh, yep. I'd like to turn it over to you from Missouri, Jamie. Excellent. You need a break. <laughs> uh, but you did a great job, Brian, these interviews. It's so great to hear, you know, such different Isn't perspectives, it? but but common, you know, the common themes and elements um, um, with both states. So thank you for that. Great. So I am very excited to introduce the Missouri team. I've had the pleasure of working with the state for the past several years. I've learned so much from them about the power of making equal opportunity a priority. Um, and I'm going to introduce the first person here on the team today. Her name is Danielle Smith. She is the State of Missouri WIOA Equal Opportunity Officer. She is a leading EOO um, in the nation and many EOs go to her for support and assistance and information. She's an incredible resource. Um, she's worked for the Department of Economic Development, Division of Workforce Development since 2006. Um, prior to being an EOO, um, she was the Regional Coordinator for the Division of Workforce Development where she managed and ministered Missouri's Job Center programs. Uh, and she's worked for private and government organizations and workforce services for over 15 years. Danielle, hi. Hi, Jamie. Hi. Can you start by giving us some background on Missouri's uh, workforce development infrastructure and your initial approach to Section 188 in your state? Well, in Missouri, we had a wonderful opportunity to uh, revamp our Equal Opportunity Program, and this allowed us to build a partnership with our Voc Rehab partners. This brought awareness to serving people with disabilities in our system. We were able to team up with the LEAF Center, uh, which assists our workforce system with uh, the requirements of Section 188. And so the LEAD Center helped Missouri with developing training um, and surveying our customers, our staff, and our employers on Section 188 accessibility. And with the LEAD Center, they also assisted us with developing training for our leadership as well as our frontline staff using Section 188 Promising Practice Guides. So Missouri's infrastructure is centered around training, universal access, and monitoring for continuous improvement. We've partnered with our local EO officers to provide monthly training to the Job Center staff on Section 188 related topics. We've also charged our local EO officers to update 
and revise local board policies and procedures to ensure customers and staff have a method of uh, providing reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications when requested without any confusion. So our local EO officers are helping ensure Missouri programs and services are integrated in the most appropriate setting, which is one of our initiatives uh, that is a part of our one-stop certification. And also in our Missouri workforce system, we're committed to ensuring that all of our customers are being served. And we've used Section 188 Promising Practices Guide as our blueprint for success. And I think people have heard me say that many times before. But we've also had the great opportunity. We have a new director, Marty Leathers, who will share with you how our system is set up and the commitment Missouri has made uh, to equal opportunity. Great. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so before I turn it over to Marty, I just want to add that the Section 188 Disability Reference Guide that we've mentioned a few uh, times here today was uh, jointly developed by ODEP, ETA, CRC, and uh, with support from the LEAD. And it's meant to assist um, AJCs by providing promising practices that correlate with the specific non-discrimination requirements in 188. And so it's an incredible resource. You'll, you'll definitely get the link um, here today. Um, but let's see, Marty, I, let me tell you a little bit about Marty before uh, we go into your questions. Marty Leathers was appointed to serve as the Director of Missouri Division Workforce Development um, in October 2017. Prior to becoming the Director, um, he served as the Executive Director of the Center for Workforce Development at, at East Central College in Union, Missouri. And there he played a key role in developing the statewide community college uh, workforce development network. And he oversaw the college's business and industry training efforts, community education, healthcare career certification, and WIOA programs. Marty, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Great, can you tell us how Missouri is demonstrated commitment to Section 188 um, for equal opportunity and non-discrimination in the job centers in your state? Absolutely, Missouri has made a commitment uh, to Section 188 implementation um, in all of our Missouri job centers by ensuring that our local workforce regions, which we have 14 of, have the staff training and knowledge to provide equal opportunities for all of our customers regardless of disability. Our state focused on empowering local regions with a $50,000 grant, which we use from our governor's discretionary funds the governor set aside from WIOA. And these funds assist the local areas with support, uh, training, and an affirmative outreach to ensure the recipients are complying with WIOA Section 188. So, wow, I can imagine that these grants, you know, help local regions with not only the motivation to seek support in TA around 188, but the message that you're, you're sending to the local workforce regions to make equal opportunity a priority. Um, but thank you, Marty, for sharing that. Um, Danielle, I'm going to go back to you. Uh, with all the regions receiving these grants and um, knowing they would be looking for more supports and resources around 188, how did you and your team um, approach and build awareness of 188 across the workforce system from workforce development boards, AJC management, staff, partners? Well, you, like I mentioned before, we partnered with Voc Rehab in Missouri to do statewide disability awareness training for all of our job centers. And this was provided with the local Centers for Independent Living. This outreach built a connection with our local partners statewide, and so we were able to ensure that our staff were able to identify and write appropriate service notes in our system. So we develop a service note training to, win, to go along with that training for our staff so that they can ensure that customers' medical information or confidential information is being stored appropriately um, separate from the the services that they were be, being received in our center. So we utilize the Section 188 Disability Reference Guide, as I mentioned before, to create mandatory yep. <laughs> staff training. And uh, we had action items for our Missouri Workforce System staff to complete. 
So we use that guide as a, a separate training track for our management as well. And we also had a separate track for our frontline staff that included like interactive group work that allowed our staff to work in teams at every job center to conduct outreach to various disability organizations and develop new partnerships. So in Missouri, our job center, they have the pleasure of hosting reverse hiring events after all of this training that we provided and given awareness to our staff. Um, these reverse hiring events uh, assisted our ind individuals with disabilities to find employment. And these events have brought awareness to hiring individuals with disabilities at a local and state and national platform. Uh, we've also been able to, to build new partnerships with Julie Brinkoff, who is the Associate Director with the Great Plains ADA Center in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, they were able to provide a series of presentations uh, for our local EO officers and staff that included ADA overview, uh, Section 188 programmatic and physical accessibility, which a hot topic for us has been the service animal and ADA, as well as serving uh, customers with disabilities. So um, this has been mm -hmm. great for our system. It's it sounds like you really are taking a kind of a multi-pronged approach in terms of, you know, leveraging your partnerships on the local level to provide that cross-training and partnership building, but also, you know, using the guide and that kind of resource to move forward with statewide virtual training to cover those kind of top level 188 and accessibility themes. So thank you so much, Danielle. Um, I want to turn to uh, the third member of the Missouri Workforce Development Team and final um, speaker today. And I, I know she'll also bring an, yet another perspective to this discussion. Yvonne Wright is the Director of Workforce Development and Business Outreach for Missouri vocational rehabilitation. She oversees the Missouri VR business outreach team. And in 2014, Yvonne was named co-lead uh, of the WIOA implementation efforts for Missouri's Department of Education with the Division of Workforce Development. She currently sits on all WIOA implementation committees and was instrumental in helping to develop the WIOA combined state plan. Yvonne is also the current president of the Missouri Association of Workforce Development and the chair of the Missouri Governor's Council on Disability. And before I ask your question, Yvonne, I have to say Yvonne is the first person from VR to say, I am WIOA, I represent it. I'm part of it. <laughs> so thank you for that, Yvonne. Can you talk about what your role has been as the state of VR director in directly in, in Section 188 efforts? I, I sure can, and thanks for that lead-in, Jamie. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, you know, um, the first thing that I would say is that um, I am um, proud and honored to say that I am co-presenting with very good friends. Um, as with Virginia, we have had a longstanding relationship, vocational rehabilitation has with workforce development. We all kind of came along in 2014 and just kind of sealed the deal for us. I mean, we already had good working relationships. Danielle and I have known each other for a number of years. Um, and to me, we have a friendship. It, it transcends partnership. It goes way beyond that. And I, I really think we stand beside each other in this whole project and working together. I could not have better partners than these two and their staff in Missouri. And so, you know, while, okay, the, the law came along and VR was uh, named as a core partner, you know, Missouri Workforce Development just didn't go, okay, you know, we will be compliant and bring VR to the table. Instead, they said, okay, you know, how can we uh, work with you closer and your staff to develop um, and support the job seekers with disabilities. We really want to make this happen, Yvonne. And so this partner has allowed us to learn from each other and it's only enhanced the opportunity to share the best case practices and processes and, and also to provide that in these processes that we can put in place to support our workforce partners as well. Excellent. And can you expand on that um, and share, you know, how has that partnership at the state level impacted local level relationships, um, such as between equal opportunity officers, AJC staff, VR staff? 
Well, I know Danielle has already talked about some of the training we've done. Um, you know, I'll just tell you, any time that um, we have a new initiative or we, we want to go a certain way, we recently just um, decided to, um, to really focus some particular energy on individuals with persistent uh, mental illness. Um, and, you know, I went to Danielle and I said, uh, would your EO officer team like to take this on as a project to get out to the job centers? Yeah. Come on over. Let's talk. Let's present to the team. And I came and presented to her EO team and brought brought it to them, which tells you something about our partnership. But that's just one way that we are. What we're hoping to do is just break down some of these myths and concerns that that job center staff may have in serving people with disabilities. You know, I know they're not afraid the staff to reach across uh, to us at the local level. Uh, we have folks that um, spend time at the job centers. Of course, we're represented on all of the local workforce boards. But they're, you know, they're not afraid to reach out and ask us for help and guidance and resources. And what it's done, I think, for us in Missouri is it's given us kind of some clout and some respect uh, in our role for core partnership uh, that allows us to really, really focus in on serving the interests of our clients. And so I'm very proud of, of the support that um, the partners have provided and this, and we continue to do. Great. And how do you think um, VR's role has been vital to the 188 efforts, especially around programmatic access, which we're really emphasizing today? Well, and I'll, and I'll echo a little bit about what Danielle talked about. Um, because we can serve in this lead partnership role, we can we can really influence and help build those relationships uh, and, and lead into some more technical assistance opportunities that we haven't maybe done before. So as Danielle mentioned, we are doing a lot of trainings in the job centers and they can be, that would be VR. Uh, it might be as simple as, a, as every month um, we go over and uh, pick a different topic, a, a different disability that uh, the job center would like to learn more about and we present on that topic or we bring in our partners in the Centers for Independent Living or our sister agency and the blind agency and, and we provide those, uh, that training to the local staff but we've also done some more formal trainings as well and uh, we'll focus on disability awareness and how we can, how we can support the different uh, job seekers that come through the, the doors of the job centers. Um, and now, you know, even though we were doing some of that before, I think that Section 188 um, has helped us kind of put, put a lot of muscle to it and allowed us to really um, utilize um, the, the, the foundation behind Section 188 to help us move forward. Um, as far as program access, um, I, I'm very, very proud of the fact that uh, in our job centers, Missouri Workforce Development took a real leap forward and uh, we have some uh, assistive technology equipment uh, that has been there for quite a while, frankly, and it, some of it is an antiquated and not what, um, you know, folks with disabilities may choose to use anymore uh, for assistive technology and workforce development um, put out policy. They put out a policy issuance to all their 14 mm -hmm. regions to say, you know, we want uh, this, this equipment will be updated, this equipment will be changed. That involved um, on our Missouri Assistive Technology Project uh, mm -hmm. manager here at Missouri who is going to lead us with some training as soon as that technology is updated. I'm very proud of that because to me it really, it's a great example of how um, workforce development is really, mm -hmm. you know, and we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna move forward. Make it a priority. Yeah, making it a priority. And we do hear a lot about assistive technology. You know, some of the challenges around upkeep and and promotion and use. So thank you for that. Let me turn to the AJC certification and what has been your role and VR's role in this in Missouri. Right. So um, and I think uh, another state mentioned this as well. We uh, do have a lot of uh, teams that we formed once we OA came into play and uh, one of those teams was focused specifically on the one-stop certification process. It did involve all of our core partners as well as some additional partners through our Centers for Independent Living, Missouri Assistive Technology Project, anyone that we felt could influence and help with consultation on that team. Uh, we developed some guidance, um, uh, surveys that we were going to use uh, when we went out to the, locals, uh, the local centers to do the certification process. I was personally involved in 
uh, a local certification process myself. I'm so glad I was, as were many of our VR staff members. So it was a it was a it was our first go round, but it was a great opportunity to focus on that. But we've also, um, you know, there's that. There's the certification process. But then there's what do you do to really make those things happen and moving beyond compliance. So we're mm -hmm. really trying to focus right. a lot of uh, a lot of focus on braiding of services and how we can work together. Um, and then for business services, we're working on these developing these employment collaboratives that we call the Nexus. Um, they're ways to bring partners behind the scenes together so we can work and share job leads with one another, uh, bring employers in that will talk to us, uh, basically keeping the confusion away from the business um, of all mm -hmm. these different partners that would come together to try to, to work. And we see that as integral to helping really serve individuals with disabilities because we're working mm -hmm. together, we're sharing. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I was just really also proud that um, almost every one of our 14 regions has opted for the standing committee to focus on disability, dis uh, serving people with disabilities that was uh, suggested in WIOA. Um, most of them have done this and they've put VR representatives at the helm and then they've turned around and kind of an unexpected surprise is they uh, turned around and decided to uh, host disability inclusion events specifically on serving job seekers with disabilities. Wow, that sounds like an incredible promising practice. Wow. I mean, we hear so much again, that is a theme that comes up where workforce development professionals are seeing more people with disabilities. They want to serve, they want to learn the resources, but the confidence in really working with employers around promoting qualified people with disabilities is, is a different level. And we hear a lot about that. I'd like to hear more about that. Another, another webinar, another time. Um, <laughs> So you, you mentioned, can you share a little bit how the Equal Opportunity and VR's joint role in 188 in AJC certification um, has influenced policy in Missouri? Well, um, it, it, it has in the, in the sense that um, the team itself was responsible for developing the criteria with the WIOA 188 guidance on mm -hmm. what that certification process would look like in Missouri and what standards we were going to hold ourselves to. And then, like I said, um, we are working on different ways to move forward on those things, such as including like the assistive technology piece. So it has had some profound influence, I think, on just how we view policy um, it, within the job centers. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for sharing your insight, your work. Thank you, Danielle and Marty, for sharing your experiences. Um, I do want to kind of give you all or whoever would like to answer, you know, what are the next steps for your role in your role to continue to expand access, equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities um, under Section 188 and through your state's AJC certification? Um, Yvonne, I can, how about I'll start with you? I still think that even, again, this is our first go round. So, you know, there are things we could still improve on um, as far as, um, you know, making sure that we have all the right partners at the table for the actual certification survey and, and, uh, uh, survey and process, uh, making sure that we really make sure that's always representative of our core partners, including VR. So I would say just moving okay. forward, just be more consistent. That's a great advice. And how about you, Danielle? Well, as a state EO officer, we are required to analyze our programs and services annually. So we've done our assessment and we know we need to increase our number of individuals with disabilities who have access to service and programs and activities in our job centers. So that's one thing that we are concentrating on and will mm -hmm. continue to concentrate on. So uh, we're also in the process of um, developing and implementing our affirmative outreach plans, which is required under Section 188. And just like Yvonne had mentioned, we are partnering with the Division of Mental Health to cross-train our staff and educate and bring awareness to those individuals about our programs and services in our, in our job centers. Excellent. Excellent. Great. And Marty, you have the final word. Well, I'd just like to echo what Yvonne and, and Danielle have said. I mean, Missouri is wholly committed to this this effort, 
and and we truly uh, take it as as an honor and a duty to be a leader in this space. And so we will continue to um, allocate resources, both financial and otherwise, to supporting and broadening this effort, uh, and to supporting our local workforce regions and each of our job centers and, and our staff to support uh, um, all of our uh, our customers across the state. Great. Thank you so much to all three of you for sharing your experiences and perspectives. Great, and this brings us to the guide that we have uh, been talking about since the start. If you have not accessed it, please do. It's a really incredible resource of a nationwide collection of promising practices that um, correlate directly with Section 188. Um, also here, some notes on it does not create new legal requirements or change current requirements. Um, the practices do not preclude uh, states and recipients from de devising alternative approaches, um, and the adoption of the practices does not guarantee uh, compliance. Um, and so with that, I know we don't have much time left. I am going to turn it back to Laura for any final words. Great. Thank you, Jamie and Brian, and from our representatives from Virginia, California, and Missouri. Uh, we don't uh, have time for questions, but we do have part three in the series, which will take place on April 30th. Uh, if you have not already signed up, the PowerPoint will include a link to register. And um, I just want to end with, uh, you know, some consistent themes that I heard, and I'm only going to focus on two. And of course, and the DEI and the LEAD TA Center, you know it's all about partnerships. All three states talked about expanding, building new uh, partnerships, about collaboration, about work groups, about subgroups, and, and all of them focus on the importance of VR and the workforce relationship and how key that was to making things happen. And then the last thing that I just want to uh, mention is all states have made uh, equal opportunity a priority and are implementing strategies beyond compliance. And through the comments that were made by each of the states, it's not, it's because they want to do more. And um, there are mandatory things, but they're putting forth strategies to do more. And by doing that, they're increasing access for all job seekers, and that's what it's all about. So it's good that we, we don't have time. It means we have a lot of information shared. Really do appreciate um, the representatives from California, Missouri, and Virginia taking your time to really let everybody know how you're increasing access at the state and the local and the regional levels in your area. And so for all of you who are joining us, uh, I hope you will also be with us on April 30th. This is part three in our three-part series. And we're going to talk about uh, achieving 188 compliance and AJC certification, leaving you with some key strategies and actions from policy to procedure. And again, we will take that opportunity to address your questions. Um, from the whole series. So thank you, everyone. Please take the opportunity to complete the post-webinar survey as you lead today, and we look forward to you rejoining us on April 30th. This concludes today's webinar.